I was 41 and Kelly was 40 when we moved from Saskatchewan, Canada, to uh, Costa Rica to learn Spanish. And in case you haven't checked, that's way late to be trying to learn a new language. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, we made a few errors along the way. I guess the polite way to put that is to call them faux pas, right? Faux steps. And, uh, but, you know, the, the crazy thing about learning a second language is when you make the mistakes, you don't know it, but you hear others. And so I'll tell you a few of the others that I heard while I was there. Is that okay? There was a, one of our fellow language students was getting on bus. That was another thing that happened when none of us had cars there. We all rode public transportation. Well, he was getting on the bus behind the lady, and she kind of slipped, and he thought she was going to fall back on him, so he just kind of you know, helped her back to her place. Well, you can imagine where his hands landed. And uh, he wanted to say, excuse me. And in Spanish, there are two words that we would think were excuse me. Instead of saying, uh, perdón, he said, con permiso. <laughs> in effect, may I do that again? <laughs> then another story happened on a bus. A man was trying to make conversation with one of the Tika ladies and and uh, she mentioned his son. Yeah, he said, yeah, he's really special. Él tiene dos años. En vez de él tiene dos años. And what he said is he has two anuses. That would make him special. <laughs> then another, Rod uh, had gotten home from playing basketball. A bunch of us played basketball in the afternoon to relieve stress from learning Spanish. And uh, he got home, and he was all sweaty and needed a shower. And we all had house help. We had maids. And uh, it's not because we were wealthy, but because we were expected to by the host culture. And so when he went home, he, he went in the door, and the maid was there, and she was cleaning. And uh, he needed a shower. And instead of saying, I need to take a shower, he asked her, would you like to bathe me? And so it, it was like that for 11 months living in Costa Rica. You know, we, most of us moved there from productive ministries where people asked our opinions and kind of valued what we had to say. And we traded all that in for a leading role as the village idiot. And that's really what it felt like uh, to be beginning. Some of you have done that. You've learned second languages even as adults. And so you know what that's like. And here's what can happen. It's, an, it's a humiliating process, this language learning. And even still, I know that when I speak Spanish, I make errors all the time, all the time. But then we get it to, uh, to choose. All right, in, in the humiliation of that process, are we just going to get angry? Or will we choose just to be humble? And it's humility, not humiliation, but it's humility that I would like for us to talk about a little bit this morning. And I first want to say that this, this message took me by surprise, okay? It really did. Does anybody in the room mind that Camila is cheering the preacher on? Anybody mind that? No, we don't mind that. And so we'll give her the mic if you guys decide that we'll do that. So Tranquil and say we're not we're not stressed out. Camila is welcome, as is her music. Back to the subject of humility. This is not one that I chose. This is a subject that very much took me by surprise this week. I had gone back to the book of Philippians because we had we had mentioned it two weeks ago uh, in the message about contentment. Contentment, if you remember that. And I wanted to go back to Philippians because it's still so impressive that Paul wrote this book of joy from a prison cell. And so I was going to go back to that and let that work on me a little bit. And I actually thought that I would come to you this morning with a message about joy that Camila has already. Yet, I, uh, I, was, I was sidetracked. Because when I read the passage that we're about to read in just a few minutes about the humility of Christ, I was captured by that. And so I kind of changed course in midstream. And that's why we get to this subject today. But you know, it's not an obscure subject. Humility and its cognates, the word, 
or appeared 92 times in the Bible. So it's a pretty important recurring theme. And you've, you're very familiar with some of the verses about humility. Uh, let, let, a couple of them. Proverbs 22, 4. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor. Isn't that something that humility pays honor and life? Another one. You've heard of this from Proverbs 3, 34. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. It's from that verse that I got the title of today's message. God resists the proud. Let's see. 1 Peter 5, 5. God has promised to give grace to the humble. He opposes the proud. That contrast between humility and pride over and over again. And then, you know, maybe the most popular you've heard from Proverbs 16. Pride comes before a fall. Yeah, so we've, we've heard these verses. They're familiar verses. But I was captured this week by humility. And so uh, I wanted to invite you into the conversation that's going on in my head. And so if you will look to Philippians chapter 2, that's the passage in Philippians that uh, hijacked me this week. And uh, we can go ahead and go to that slide if you would, Les. I have, uh, have our passage on the screen for you. But uh, uh, if you'd like to turn to it in your own Bibles, you know, we, we, that's just, that's fine. That would be, you'd do well to do that as well. But I would like for us to look at this passage together and then pick a few things out of it that really kind of stuck to me this week as I was thinking about this and uh, see if it'll, it'll uh, be a blessing for you as well. I'll read along. You can follow along with me either on the screen or in your Bible. From Philippians 2, beginning at verse 3. And the uh, Word of God says this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you looking to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same Mindset as Christ Jesus. And then here's the example. Who being in the very nature of God. Did not consider equality with God. Something to be used to his own advantage. Rather he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So that passage starts with Paul saying, hey, be humble toward one another. And that's, isn't that really where humility makes its greatest impact? When, when it shows up, when we're relating to one another, when we're relating to other people. And isn't that also where, sh where pride is so ugly, is when it comes out in the way another person would treat another. But in our relationships, Paul just says this. He said, hey, let's all just agree. Let's be humble toward one another. And uh, he, then he goes to that amazing example. But uh, humility is a mindset. And I, as I was working on that this week, I was thinking, well, let's see, humility, it's, it's not really something that I can even do. I tried this week again. I tried to do humility. And as I watched myself, even my attempts to do humility, I could see, I could see the signs of self-service. And, you know, Sometimes we try so hard to serve so well, hoping that somebody may see us. Hear, hear the quandary there? And, and I'm saying, okay, I'm going to do humility. And it still ends up having some version of self-service. It's a very difficult thing to do. And so it's not really a verb, but it's a noun. It's a noun that we choose. It's a posture that we take. The word that Paul used here was mindset. I love that word, mindset. 
You know, I'm thinking other ways we use the word set. We set traps. Set. Ready. Humility, the mind set that anything may make go off at any time. Instead of, you know, the external circumstances prompt me to be proudful or angry, that even external circumstances would prompt me because of my mindset to be humble. Oh, that's, that's, what, I, that's what I really want to happen. Humility is, is others focused. You can see that here if you'll we'll look at, at verse 3. Don't do anything out of selfish ambition or a cheap desire to boast, another translation says. But look out for the interests of others. Think, think back to how, this morning, you know. And this is all kind of a self-examination. We're all in the same, all in the same boat here. But when we walked in these doors, what were we thinking? What was I thinking? How do I look? <laughs> what do people think of me? You know, will people come back last week because of me? Thinking of me? Or when I came into the room, was my mindset such, a mindset of humility, that I came in wondering who's hurting? Who needs, who needs a hug? Is there anybody here who feels all alone who I can serve? So, you know, even coming in the doors, any, any room that I enter, what is my mindset? Am I thinking about myself, what people are thinking of me? Or can I get beyond myself and come into the room wondering who's here, who's missing, who needs a greeting, who needs a welcome? Who needs a handshake? It's others' focus. C.S. Lewis said this. You've heard this probably before. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Yeah, that's what I want to do. When I walk into this room on Sunday mornings, I want to think of you. Instead of wondering what you think of me. Thinking of yourself less. And then he goes to the example. And uh, you know he shoots right to the top, doesn't he? He goes so quickly to because I think he's thinking, you know what? They're going to think this is impossible, or maybe that I'm crazy. How can we get past the? You're crazy if you think I can do that stage. Well, he gives us a picture, and how often you know I need a picture if I'm trying to learn to do something new. If I can see somebody do it, man, that really takes me far. And so he gives us the picture, and he looks to Jesus right there who being in the very nature of God, verse 6, didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. If anybody had advantages as he walked this earth, it was Jesus, wasn't it? And look what he did with that. He chose the mindset <clears throat> of humility. And then he goes on about the way he served. You know, his obedience to God and his service to man. <clears throat> That's what Jesus did with it. So you know, that helps me. Not only does Paul give us a great picture of what humility looks like, but then I think he is, he's implying the, the promise. You know, I just don't need to see Jesus, to recognize him, to know things about him. I need his help. And he can not only give me an example to follow, He'll say, hey, you know what? I'll come in and li I'll live inside you. That's how we do humility. So he, he not only points to the example, but he points to the source. So how, to where, how we can do that. I tried to come up with a picture, another picture that uh, would happen. You know, uh, if you'll go ahead and go to that next slide there, Les. Um, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and I'm betting you wish I would use more pictures and maybe fewer words. But uh, I, I, I just said, what's a pic what prompts me and gives me a picture in addition to the Jesus picture? What gives me a picture as I go about my days of humility and prompts me not to abandon that mindset that Jesus very much is helping all of us to have? 
And so that's what I picked. And uh, how many of you have had those kinds of experiences? I, I know some of you like going to the ocean. And the closest ocean we have is usually the Gulf. Some of you like to go there on your vacations. And one of the things that the ocean always does to you, doesn't it? It does to me when you're standing there. It makes you feel small. Yeah. Kelly and I are going to go to Colorado in a couple of weeks. And one of the reasons we like going to Colorado is because you see a scene like this. It makes you feel small. But that's, that's just a demeaning thing so far. Let's take that on to another step. Not only can I feel small in God's creation, but it, it's really a recognition of the vastness of God. And because, see, if, if creation is big, the creator is bigger. You and I can't make stuff bigger than us. And so that creation beckons us to see ourselves in proper perspective. To see ourselves as small. But not just because maybe we're insignificant. We're going to talk about that. It's not at all what it means. But just the vastness of God is so big. Um, you know, we're only three hours away from the Davis Mountains. Most people don't even get that far. Gene goes every week. And you can get this. You can get this in the Davis Mountains. Real mountains. You know, mile high. Three miles west, of, three hours west of here, and uh, dark, and to see the sky. You've heard me talk about that before. You know, how many of you have seen this? They'll post it on Facebook some these days. It starts. There's a picture of a girl. She looks like she's like in a lawn chair in her backyard, but then it zooms out, and it shows her neighborhood, and it keeps zooming out, and then it shows the city, and then it keeps zooming out further. And it shows California, it's where she is. But it keeps zooming back. Then you see the United States. And, and then you see the globe, the earth. And it keeps zooming back, it goes past the moon. And it goes past the sun. You know, our, our own little solar system. Out past beyond that. Past the uh, Milky Way galaxy. It becomes a spot as the, it zooms out. And then on... on Further, 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 out into the universe. And then it comes back. And just the vastness, such a great reminder to me of the vastness, not only of the universe, the vastness of God. And one of the things that helps me toward this mindset of humility is remembering how very, very big God is. I think that impressed the psalmist too. Psalm 8, I don't have a slide for it. You can look it up in, in your Bible if you'd like. Uh, I think the psalmist was thinking about this very stuff. David is the one who wrote this, Psalm 8. And he starts out like this with the mag majesty of God. Then he goes to man, and then he goes back to God. Just like that picture, zooms in, zooms out. Starts out like this, Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of the enemy to silence the foe and the avenger. See, big God, focus on even an infant. And uh, then it goes on to say about us, you made us uh, a little lower than the heavenly be beings and you crowned us with glory and honor. Does it mean that we're not valuable? To think of a big God doesn't mean that. And he goes on to say, in fact, he gave us a real important job to do. You, you made us ruler over all the works of your hands, all flocks and herds, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You see, humility, the mindset of humility, isn't just saying, I'm a worm. I was recognizing we're, we are that unique part of God's creation made in His own image with, with a really important job to do, manage His creation. Yet, on each end of that psalm, it begins and it ends with the reminder, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth. So it's, Big God that helps me most 
take that mindset of humility, big God. Spurgeon put it this way, let us measure ourselves by our master. Then pride will be impossible. Not good, not good. I actually thought, and you know, sometimes uh, uh, Camila does wear out of the preacher, wear out, you know, and, and has to leave the room, so I didn't ask you guys if I could do this. But we, you see her there. And uh, I think one of the things that attracts us to little bitty children, the little babies in the room, you know, a baby enters the room, guess where everybody looks? They look at the baby, don't they? Okay, why do you think that may be? You know, we're all made in God's image. So, well, that's all of us, though. What, what makes them different? Why do we see them? Past, we look past each other to see these little babies. And in my mind, I'm wondering if it's this. If their humility is still so well-preserved that the image of God is still so clear in those little babies. Totally dependent. No reasons for arrogance. When they walk into the room, they don't even know, what can I do to get people to look at me? <laughs> they don't even think of that. And then their inherent humility. I think we see a picture of the glory of God in these little babies because it's not yet been tainted by pride. And that's my speculation. But I'm wondering that. And we can. We can look at these little babies and we can see, wow, we have a new picture, a better picture, a clear picture of what God's like because a little baby was made in his image. Yeah. And the humility is still well preserved. That's my speculation, I'm thinking. All of this to say, wow, that we can all be that way. Oh, I want to be that way. I want us to be. I want, when people come in this room, I want them to feel overwhelmed by people who are serving them, care about them. Yeah, that's what servanthood is. You know that old servanthood deal? When we volunteer, you know, we pass it around the sheet, we say, hey, sign up for VBS or sign up to work in the kitchen on Wednesdays. When we volunteer, that's serving. That, that's, that's real. That's true. That's good. But what about the kind of servanthood when somebody's just treating me? like a servant. And I didn't have a chance to volunteer for this deal. Oh, see how when we, when we, when even this week when I tried to do humility, I saw, <laughs> wow, I can't do this on my own. This is something, I can choose, but it's a work that God's going to have to do in my life. Let's see, pride says this, hey, I'm somebody. But humility says this, Lord, you blow me away. Yeah. Pride says, I can do it. Humility says, you are my strength. Pride says, I'm not really all that bad. Humility says, I'm a mess. Mm -hmm. Pride says, go ahead and show that next slide there, Les. Men working. You know, isn't it interesting? Ladies never put up a sign that says, ladies working. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying to draw attention to ourselves, even with our signs, guys. Pride says, man, working here. I'm at work. I'm going to be a good Christian. I'm at work here. But humility says, show the next slide. Yeah. In fact, even better than this, I'll take this sign, the next one, less. Yeah. Not just one that needed. Pride says, hey, I'm working here. And humility says, please be patient with me. God's not finished with me yet. Yeah. R.W. Start said this about that pride is your greatest enemy. Humility, your greatest friend. Yeah. And that's why I came up with the title that I did for this message. And you can go ahead and show that if you would, Les. Um, you know, isn't it amazing that a, uh, an omnipotent creator of the whole wide universe, God, 
would uh, be impeded by our pride. And uh, it, pride, like those verses we said, pride comes before a fall, you know. Pride keeps God back, and humility welcomes him. How we, we can even erect a wall that God will not violate, and that wall is pride. But if we, if we choose the mindset of humility, it's like this. How many of y'all have seen, we've all seen, you know, houses being built. What's the very first thing they do? Pour a slab. Put a foundation. You can't build a house before you build a foundation. And I think then humility, if I can use that metaphor, for us is, is taking that mindset and saying, okay, God, the only thing I've got to offer is my humility. Now build, build on top of that. Build on that. But our pride would keep him back. Pride the place where God cannot work. That's a really scary thing to me. C.S. Lewis put it this way. Let me do this. Andrew Murray. I want to see this is a little longer. Andrew Murray. Pride must die in you or nothing of heaven can live in you. Yeah. C.S. Lewis. As long as you're proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you can't see anything that's above you. Yeah. I've, uh, I've watched an example of this. I have a friend, and, uh, you know, granted, I can't see his heart. Okay, that's my admission. I know that. But from the signs that I'm seeing, man, pride, pride is intact. And it's expressed in so many different ways. And, and I don't say this with any kind of glee. It's, it breaks my heart to see this, this friend of mine. Because uh, I, uh, I see him saying, I can do it. And he's obviously weighing over his head. He's, I see him saying, I'm important. And he is, that's true. But he can't help the people around him because he's so self-important. And uh, I just, I prayed and prayed and prayed for this friend. Oh Lord, that you would break through and Make him a new man again. And I've just seen this example. He's keeping God back. His pride's keeping God back. And, you know, I'm at risk. I have my versions of that too. So I'm not placing myself outside of the very, very same possibilities. That's probably why I even notice it. Because I have my versions of that too. But that I would let God continue to root that pride mess out of my life and our lives. And so that we can say, Lord, all I've got is humility. I need your help. And you come and do the work that only you can. You know, how many of you know, friends, that you really are hoping that God can do a work in their life or a new work in their life. And you see them stiff-arming God with pride. Breaks your heart, doesn't it? Breaks your heart. Well, not so we'll take the attention off of our own problems and only try to def defer to other people. You know what? Uh, I need work that God does in my life this week. I really do. I need him to do work. I need him to do works in my life and through my life in such a way that it doesn't just draw attention to me and I leave the room thinking, oh, they think highly of me now. Because if that's all the product is, then God can't do the work. I want him to do the work.